Yeah, Mexican! Okay, 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 okay. All right, fight fans, welcome to Caveman Corner with your host, Jeff. Captain Caveman! Thanks. All right, we got another great podcast going. We've been getting current uh, UFC stars. We've been getting past UFC stars. We have another great star today. Who'd you bring in for us today, Ray? Mark the Cobra Hall. All right, we're going to get Mark Hall on the phone, and we're going to get this podcast going. All right, I got Mark Hall on the line. How's it going, Mark? Good, good, very good. How you guys doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Mark said he's going to say no comment to everything right before we went uh, recording, but we're not going to let that happen, are we, Ray? No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he's, at, he's at the cave now. <laughs> All right. I'll th- take you to the Cobra Courthouse. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Speaking of the courthouse, we can just start right with that. Uh-oh. Oh, shit. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Uh, we've had a lot of guys on, and almost every one of them has hated Ken Shamrock's guts. But you really hate Ken Shamrock's guts. Can you uh, give us some details on this story? Yeah. Um, well, lo- let me take you back to um, about uh, 2000, uh, or maybe around 1999, or t- yeah, about 1999, he, him and his crony m- mugged me in a casino. Um, I was, uh, I was, you know, it's a long story, but I have it written word for word in my book and I put it on my website, but the short end of it, you know, is that, you know, he, he teamed up with Terry Treblecock, but they wanted me to quit doing shows in California. Um, Ken... Uh, had uh, taken advantage of me on a, a business deal that we had, and him and Terry invited me. Well, uh, Terry Treblecock of King of the Cage invited me over to a uh, casino uh, that he's at. Um, any, anyway, that casino where he was doing the shows at here in Southern California, and uh, to set me up for an ambush. And when I got there, I saw it. I knew what they were up to, and so I was going to bring it out in them, you know, like just uh, if something was going to happen, it was going to happen uh, in the place I wanted it to happen and the time that I wanted it to happen, so not when they wanted it to happen. So I walked over where he was, and sure enough, you could tell all his guys were in on it. They um, Ken was being interviewed, and they uh, threw – a towel over the Roman camera, not a towel, a jacket, over the camera that was interviewing Ken. And they all made a wall around us. Uh, they trapped me in this vestibule, but, I mean, I wasn't trying to get out. I was just looking at them like, you know, so what? And then uh, they kind of started hitting me from behind, and I turned around, and when I turned back, Ken uh, uh, sucker punched me as hard as he could, and, you know, I kind of went down, I, I guess the, I uh, I went out for, like, you know how you go out for, like, a split second, you know, and you wait back up. And, Rachel, um, you know, it gets knocked out all were, the time. <laughs> they were all draw. <laughs> they were all dropping bombs on me, um, and knees, elbows, and stuff like that, so I wasn't, I wasn't even hurt, I was uh, 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 bleeding, in the spot where he hit me, you know, on my uh, lip, because my tooth went through my lip. And I looked at the uh, cameras that were there in that vestibule area, and I knew I had him. And so I took him to court, to make a long story short, and I sued him for a fight. And he was supposed to come and fight me at my event, because I was actually doing events at the time at Indian Casinos here in Southern California. And so, uh, for, uh, for him to, you know, get out of the lawsuit, uh, he was supposed to, and by the way, I'm not a too happy guy. I've never sued anybody in my life. I, I was not ever seeking a financial victory. It was all about 
hey, if you're going to punch me, uh, sucker punch me for nothing in a casino, then uh, you're going to meet me in the middle of the a cage, motherfucker, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> bleep, bleep. <laughs> no, you can swear we're good. And, uh, and, and so he um, uh, he tried every way in the world to avoid it, and but we were, me and my lawyer uh, pressured him, and he got uh, pride out of Japan to take the fight. Because remember, that was on his comeback from WWF, and he was about to, uh, and he had just got a, a contract with uh, Pride. Well, uh, Pride said yes, and of course, if they wanted all the litigation, and they were going to build the fight up as the biggest grud match in MMA history. And um, and um, then Ken, uh, um, he canceled our first date for our fight, Ooh, you guys had a date? Canceled the second date. <laughs> huh? Yeah. I was like, you guys got a oh, date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, a little homo. <laughs> <little faggot>. and, <laughs> That's how you get a name like Glamrock, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's something else. I went down to uh, Bellator 156 or whatever it was, uh, March, and when he was fighting Hoyt. And I got into it with him uh, there uh, back stage after the weigh-in. I walked right up to him, and I had this uh, a poster in my hand, and I handed it to him. Well, he didn't recognize me because I hadn't seen him for 12 years, and he was looking at it, and I, I'm, I'm holding his head in my hand. It, it's actually his head, <laughs> and I'm holding it in my hand. You know, it's an image of him and me, and it, it's... You know, the neck bone is sticking out and it's uh, bleeding everywhere. And I go, and he and he thought I was a, a fan wanting him to sign a poster. And he started looking at it a little closer and he realized, hey, that's my head. And <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, who are you? And I go, I'm your worst nightmare, motherfucker. I'm Mark Hall. <laughs> I said, before you slip back into retirement, you got one more fight left and that's with me, you know. Oh, yeah. And he started arguing, you know, and. Um, I've already kicked your ass. And I said, yeah, you uh, sucker uh, punched me in a casino. You hit me when I wasn't uh, uh, looking. And I said, you uh, canceled our fight uh, uh, two times. And I said, uh, 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 you know, uh, now it's finally caught up with you. It's, it's, it's the time for me and you to finish our business. And he, um, his wife grabbed him and said, come on, Ken, you know, let's go, you know, and so they started walking off. Then the security ran over there and grabbed me and, and tried to throw me out and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, me and my entourage. But, uh, so anyway, I, uh, um, you know, I've been after him for a long time. And, uh, uh, uh you know, they built him, hoist and his fight up like it's, uh, like it's some kind of a real, good, grudge match or something like yeah. some score they needed to settle which Hoist. was a bunch of uh, bullshit Hoist me and him have a real <laughs> grudge match you know a real grudge match you know from hell hey mark and uh but yep yeah. um hoist kick him yeah. in his vagina <laughs> <laughs> hoist, hoist gracie yeah. kicked him in his vagina <laughs> <laughs> well well i actually um <laughs> uh was was gonna hand him uh, uh, some. Um, uh, what was I gonna give him? Vagisil. Uh, and we forgot all about it. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna give him a, a box of uh, of uh, Kotex, uh, I think, or something like that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, just to fuck with him some more. But <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's my story. <laughs> and I'm sticking, sticking to it. it. So. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, what was the official outcome of the court case of the lawsuit? Oh, the judge ordered us to fight. He okay. started laughing. The San Diego judge ordered us to fight. Um, a lot of the documentation and things like that, maybe on the oh, oh, oh yeah, but a lot of the documentation is on the website, and and there's also a a little video at the end of um uh, at at the end of our dispute on, that that I posted on the website. And it has me in a bar, you know, like um, the, the most interesting man, uh, that guy on the Dos Equis commercial where he says, you, you know, I don't always drink, but when I do. So I said, I don't often kick ass, 
But when I do, I prefer to kick Ken Shamrock back. <laughs> Where'd you get those girls <laughs> from? They're, they're, yeah, I saw it. Those were pretty, pretty girls next to you. Are those oh, yeah, girlfriends yeah, or what? Girls, what we got yeah. going on? <laughs> That's my girlfriend, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to call the ladies, man. <laughs> hey, Mark. <laughs> Mark was in Buffalo, oh, yeah. New York, USC 7. <laughs> Yeah, you were in uh, Buffalo for UFC 7. I actually watched you fight Harold Howard and uh, that giant polar bear of a man, Paul Barlins. <laughs> How was that night? Yeah, fight? yeah. Um, yeah, I was uh, UFC 7. I had a. Well, I was going to tell you about the judge when I got off on that, but the judge ordered us to fight, and he goes, um, uh, and, and, uh, first time I've ever order two people suing each other to fight. People that sue each other want to fight each other. But this is the first time I've ordered it. And he started laughing, you know, and he, he <laughs> said, I can't believe it. So anyway, um, I got a, I was trying to get in UFC, uh, the UFC from the very beginning, uh, after UFC one. And then by the time UFC five came around, uh, they promised me a spot and then that, that fell through. And then they uh, called me. At the last minute, uh, on like a four-day notice to fight in UFC 7. And, um, uh, oh, yeah, because one of the um, contestants um, the, from the Taekwondo category, you know, back then they had categories, um, j- dropped out because he, he was uh, on the U.S. Taekwondo Olympic team, and the Olympic Committee wouldn't let him fight. So I just got uh, uh, lucky, and I got in the main draw, and, and uh and he, uh, and Art Davies uh, called me on the phone. I was sitting in my office and he, yeah, you know how, you know, he goes, hello, Mark Hall, this is Art Davies. <laughs> and my, then I almost fell out of my chair, you know, I said, wow, <laughs> you know, this is it, this is it. And he goes, he goes, yeah, are you in good shape right now? And I said, hell yeah. He goes, can you make it to New York? Hell yeah. And after that, everything was a yeah, you know, yes, yes, yes. And so, um, I went down there and uh, I, I uh, flew down there the next day. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. But it was such an awesome event because um, th- it was the only event that Michael Buffer announced. And I grew up with him, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we grew up watching him on television back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, announced in Muhammad Ali the fight and, you know, George Foreman, Joseph Joe Frazier and, you know, Ken Norton. And, uh, and I was like, uh, so hearing Michael Buffer, you know, coming right out of your backyard in, into a huge televised event was actually amazing. You know, it was awesome. But I, uh, you know, a lot of people would have to catch up with their, their self, you know, because, you know, it's not something that I, gradually worked my way up to uh, from an amateur like they do now you know it's 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 like i i never had an amateur career so i went right into the uh, professional pro and uh yeah you know i was already fighting every weekend uh, yeah you know I, I was working in the roughest bars at the time so I was already in that mode. I, I was all, already, uh, you know, comfortable with real fights and stuff like that. So, and I and I grew up fighting when kids would make in front of my handicap. So, you know, it was. Um, and I was running the martial arts uh, schools at the time. So I, I was the, the perfect, you know, real martial artist uh, to go into an event like that. Most fighters, you know, maybe not now, but right after. Me went in the UFC and then opened up schools. I already had martial arts uh, schools, and then I went in the UFC. You see, yeah. so um, so it's just the opposite. And I know, you know, I'm not gonna. I'll name a few like uh, Dan Henderson. He he didn't go in, and he did well, you know, but he didn't have a you know a school until he uh, started fighting. You know, so hey, what's what what's uh, that, what style of martial arts you study? When you first came in the uh, UFC? Well, I was studying jiu-jitsu, but I didn't let anybody know it. Um, I was one of those uh, guys who had already bought the Gracie tapes out of Black Belt Magazine, you know, the, those four Gracie tapes that they were selling. And because I had heard so many good things about the art, 
and uh, you know, was learning about this family uh, and uh, stuff like that. And but the UFC hadn't come out yet. All I heard about was the challenge that they uh, offered uh, from their dojo. If you can come in our school and beat one of us with your martial art, we'll give you ten thousand dollars. You know, and so I was going to go collect the money. And uh, <laughs> then when the, the UFC <laughs> came out, I thought, wow, uh, well, you know, knowing that you can't beat a man at his own game, I was, um, what do you call it, uh, learning his game, learning the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and it was all the basics. All those four videos were the basics of uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And it was working really well. So I was, I dissected all those tapes with a few of my top students. And I, um, uh, was pre actually preparing to go down to the Gracie Academy in Torrance to take the challenge when the first UFC came out. And I knew that the a challenge was, was demolished now. I, I knew that you wouldn't be able to do it because the Gracies were handling it all right there in the octagon. And I uh, got it live on pay-per-view, invited my students over to watch it, and I made that announcement, hey, I'm going to be in that, you know, uh, real soon. And uh, it's true to my word, I uh, kept um, promoting myself with the UFC, and, uh, you know, uh, they finally called me. So, as they say, the rest is history, so. You said you were secretly studying jiu-jitsu, but uh, earlier you said when you were uh, applying for UFC 7, the Taekwondo guy got pulled out. And is that what you told UFC, that you studied Taekwondo? Or actually watching, you have it seems like you have more of a Thai style than any kind of like traditional martial arts style. I was just kind of wondering what your actual style was. Yeah, I forgot to tell you. Yeah, it, it was Mu Ye Do. Um, you know, I was a uh, uh, fourth degree black belt in Tiger Yang's uh, Mu Ye Do uh, art. And um, I uh, was also uh, very versed in other arts, uh, kickboxing, wrestling, a little bit of wrestling, not a lot, but a little bit. And then um, um, uh, Western boxing and keto. Um, Muya Do is a hybrid of uh, Taekwondo, uh, uh, keto, and Kung Fu. So... Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of the Taekwondo in the art, you know, kicks and stuff like that. So they actually had me in the Taekwondo category. If if somebody dropped out, they would, you know, uh, have me available for that category. So, yeah, I, I went in in the Taekwondo category. So Awesome, man. That's really yeah. cool. You talked about your disability earlier as well. Can you uh, tell the fans a little bit about that? Yeah, um, well, I grew up... Uh, uh, better and real bad, way worse than I do now. Um, sometimes I, I, I can, and now most, most of the time I can speak really well. Um, I'm not really good at interviews and stuff like that, so I'm kind of nervous right now, but... Um, Don't be nervous. No one listens to us anyways. <laughs> 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 we got we got $100,000 studio and two ten cent hosts, so we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're not so popular yet, but we're working our way up. We had Coleman on. We just had Choke Again on. We had Dan the Beast. Dan the Beast Severn. Fred Eddish. Fred wow. Eddish. And now we got you, man. We got the Cobra. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cobra. I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Can you go back to talk about your disability? <laughs> I was trying to get a heartwarming story, and I yeah. fucked it all up. <laughs> no. No, no. And then, uh, uh, well, uh, I talk about it in my book. It's actually the first chapter in my book. It's called Growing Pain. And I couldn't talk at all, so I couldn't I couldn't speak for 20 years of my life. So if you can't talk, you can't tell people who you are, so you're nobody, you know? So your confidence gets low. Talking is how we build confidence. So a lot of people don't think of it as a handicap, but it, it's a really, really bad handicap. You, you miss out on so much. I couldn't ask a girl out on a date. I couldn't talk to her. I mean, if I wasn't good looking, I would have never probably had a date, you know? So, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, uh, I'm not good looking and I can talk and I never I had a date. So. Start laughing, but <laughs> I never had a date back in school. Yeah, we're, we can talk and we didn't really get dates either. So I, <laughs> I was quiet in high school. I was 
I stuck to myself. <laughs> I just wish I was handsome. I think I could have got some girls if I had, was handsome. I think so too. <laughs> if I was handsome, uh, I'd be confident. And I'd be talking all the time. Yeah, but I was ugly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, if um, it, it was just real, real tough. Eventually, the girl. I, I used to have to act shy, even though I wasn't. I would act that way, so I wouldn't have to speak, you know, and embarrass the holy shit out of myself because I couldn't get one word out. I mean, if you asked me my name, it would take me 10 minutes to tell you my name. Damn. So it, it was really, really tough, and I got made fun of all the time. And a lot of times people would do it in front of girls and stuff, and people would call me retarded and stuff. And I, I mean, you know, it, it was just... Um, you know, uh, bullying and stuff like that. It was, uh, so, you, you know, I, I, my father taught me to fight. He was my first martial art instructor, and his living room was my first dojo. And, um, you know, I um, I wouldn't put up with it. I'm, I mean, I would uh, meet him after school or fight him right there in the hallway. But most of the time, I meet him after school. When I was in elementary school, I'd meet him at the bike rack <laughs> and we'd go across the street for the main event. In in middle school, I would meet him down by the uh, down by the uh, river, fight, down by the fight uh, tree where everybody met to uh, you know who wanted to fight after school. But and um, it it got to be quite a bit and um, so much that. You, you, you know, some people call it the main event, you know. And um, so, but then sometimes I didn't feel like fighting because it was like, you know, sometimes you don't, and but you have to anyway. And, you know, you just get tired of it. Um, by the time I got out of high school, um, I quit high school before the 11th grade, and it was just a big relief. It, it was just a big uh, weight off my shoulders and everything. And uh, so... Um, but um, now what was the question? <laughs> I asked you uh, how the disability was and growing up with a disability, so that's that's what we were talking about, really. <laughs> I was waiting well, for the heartwarming and, story. <laughs> yeah, I knew I had to start uh, speaking. I knew I was missing out, and I guess I I started talking when I actually got in the army. Uh, you know, those drill sergeants get in your face <laughs> and start yelling and stuff. And I, uh, you know, I, I, could imagine. I finally got them put out. Finally, you know, you have to say yes, sir, or no, sir, and all that crap. So yes, it was but... pretty tough. Um, you know, it wasn't easy, but I finally, I don't know how I made it through it all, to be honest with you. Uh, but somehow I did, and here I am. So Yeah, the drill sergeant would get it out of you. <laughs> when you were so in introverted, did you uh, write a lot? I didn't write a, uh, a lot. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I had to write what I wanted to say. So I, I would write it down and uh, show people, you know, to, to what I want, wanted to say. So, yeah, I did. And, and so, I, but I, it, it, not, it not so much made me become a writer because I'm really not a writer at all. Um, I've only been in a library twice in my whole life, and, <laughs> and, and I've never, I'm not a reader, so I just, um, I really just wanted to get my story out there, and hopefully it would maybe help someone else, you know, who had a handicap or something, you know, but uh, I wanted to be a good in influence on people, and, you know, uh, I, I I always fought bullies, I I, I always fought the playground uh, bully, and I always uh, wanted to beat him up. I I never I, I liked nice people, and I was always overly nice to everybody, so nobody would make fun of me. So that kind of carried over into my adulthood, and then later on in, in life, I it kind of messed me up in a lot of ways. Um, when I finally did start talking, I didn't know how to start a conversation. I didn't know what to talk about. And believe it or not, it, it still plagues me to this day. It, it's real easy for me to lose my train of thought and and all that stuff, you know. You know, you always want to face your worst challenge. You always want to be a public speaker or something, you know. <laughs> uh, 
and, I, and uh, no way. There's no fucking way. I <laughs> I exported that idea for a while, and then I realized, you know, uh, that's a, a good thought, Mark. You, you know, it's good to face your uh, fears and get the courage to, to 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 talk in front of people and stuff. But you don't have to do that. You know, you don't got to beat yourself up any more just just relax and forget about it all you know and just because i can you know i speak okay to get by now and you know i'm, I'm fine uh and a lot of the interviews uh back in the old ufc's you know i was substituting things i could say for things that i couldn't say and stuff like that so a lot of times your conversations or interviews will come out not sounding like you want them to and stuff because you're substituting words and stuff and all that crap like that you know it's hard to get out of all that it finally becomes a part of your personality i'd like to leave it all behind and just you know pretend like i've been talking all my life you can't do that it it, um it it becomes part of your uh part of your personality and uh you know your makeup of who you are and things like that and i just kind of left it at, at what it is and just accepted it now you know it's part of me you know i was scared of public speaking my whole life and now i have a podcast do uh post fight interviews with all the fighters in front of like all the hundreds and thousands of people that uh come out to the fights I don't yeah know, i don't know how that even happened man i used to hate talking in front of two people and now i talk in front of <laughs> hundreds of people <laughs> same here <laughs> well because you're um you've done it you've uh, stepped out of your comfort zone and you've done it many times and you got comfortable with it and you got good at it so you know, you you got to do something over and over again to get comfortable with it, you know? I think it was just because it was all uh, sweaty dudes. But now that the girls fighting, I get embarrassed in there with the girls. Just I, saying. I used to be scared ah! talking to girls. <laughs> I used to be scared talking to girls. Hey, next time you see Ronda Rousey, slap her ass for <laughs> and tell her to start <laughs> I will do that. But when I end up in jail, I would like uh, you to come bail me out. And uh, maybe you can write it. You know I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Add an well, extra chapter uh, in your book. <laughs> you know, what do they say? I mean, uh, uh, the buddy will come and bail you out of jail, but your your best friend will be sitting beside you in jail. <laughs> so you're not my best friend; you're just a buddy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I, I'll be there with you, dog. I'll, I'll go down there with you. You know. <laughs> You gotta have protection in jail. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I need a big, big tough guy to keep me safe, or at least someone that's handsome to keep the the lurchers off me. <laughs> Bubba, you gotta watch out for Bubba in jail. Did you, uh, <laughs> did you write your book yourself, or did you have a ghostwriter? How does the whole book writing process go? And where could we buy your book at? We, I don't know if we could go to your website, but could you go to Amazon or any other uh, bookstore? Well, you can tell I wrote it if you read some of it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, and say I, I didn't book, have no but I, will, I will. Yeah, it's 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 me all the way. I mean, um, I should have had a professional edit, but I didn't have the money. So a bunch of friends helped me. Uh, smart friends helped me edit it, including a lawyer friend of mine helped me a little bit. And they told me to take some of the stuff out of it, but I didn't want to, especially about about God and uh, uh, quite a bit of my. Um, my growing, my elementary years of growing up, take some of that out and this and that and the other. And, you know, I told him, you know, you know, that's me. I'm just telling the, the truth. I'm just being honest here, you know, and it's how I express myself and it's how I talk and it's how I write. So you can tell it's from me. It's from my heart. You know, it's, it's uh, and I really wanted, uh, but if I had a, a you know, you, you, you can always do a better job the second time. And so I always often thought about it. it. It took a long time to write that book. It took three and a half years. And it has, what, oh, over 800 images in it. A lot of uh, time. I, uh, it was at a, a time when the Great Depression was going on here in Southern California. There was no work. And, you know, because I had a construction company, a house, uh, a motor home. A uh, little dog and a wife, and you know uh, when the great de uh, the bad economy hit here, I call it the Great Depression because it really hit California hard. And then I lost everything. I I, I wasn't working, so I had time to write, you know. And so uh, I always wanted to write uh, the book, especially to showcase my contribution to this great sport. 
because um, a lot of people don't know that I was a promoter, a fighter. They just know me as a fighter, you know. They didn't know I was a promoter. I uh, I even had a women's fight league. I oh I, yeah, um, that's always good. I um, in some of some of my later events, I was the ring announcer and the referee. Um, just uh, things like that. Uh, I had fights uh, uh, goals. I was a trainer. I had a fighting stable who I took all over the world fighting with me. Um, so I was involved in like almost every aspect of it. And a lot of that stuff gets lost in history and nobody knows how uh, your contribution to this great sport. Nobody knows what you put into it unless you, uh, unless you uh, tell them because, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the older fighters w will be uh, forgotten if it wasn't if you didn't um, you know let people know in some way and I thought the book would, would be a good way to let people to uh, you know know my con uh, you know your contribution my huge contribution to this great sport and all the people hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that I got involved in it you know? hey and, uh, uh, but um, Mark um how about uh, Legend of the Cage? You got to be you got to be part of it, and um, Brian Moore is yeah. doing an excellent job. All the older fighters, and uh, and hey, he he's doing a movie, No Way Out. So, what do you think about that? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, um, I told him uh, that I can talk now. That I, I want to speak. <laughs> <the part. laughs> <laughs> you gonna be you gonna be part of the movie, huh? All of huh? a sudden, I can speak real good now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I thought that was uh, awesome. You know, I, I I mean, what an awesome thing. Uh, he's he's made a lot of head headway now. Uh, you know, uh, on his way up to this movie, and it's it will it'll it'll you know it may even cause some uh, a copycat to come out with with some which will give us even more rec recognition but um i'm, I'm going to say something think, uh, that that's going to hurt your feelings right now one time i paid uh i think 22 dollars to go see a movie just cuz Ken Shamrock was in it and there was some UFC fighters in it i don't even remember what the fucking movie was it was some bullshit movie but it was the first time a UFC yeah. fighter was in it, and I went and seen it, and I want that twenty-two dollars back. So if I ever see Ken Shamrock, he owes me twenty-two bucks. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I had to say that. I couldn't, I couldn't hold it in no more. <laughs> I love it, man. That's it. <laughs> I think everybody wants a piece of that motherfucker. Everybody, he owes everybody twenty-two dollars. <laughs> he owes me. He owes me a lot of money. I, I mean, honestly, he, uh, you know, he, he cost me. A lot of money, and I want to explain it to you, you know, now because it would take too long. But uh, you got all the time if I in the just world. told you half the story, yeah. it would be, you know, you would want to know the other half. So, but it's all in the book. But and it's yeah, also on um, your website. If you go to uh, markcobrahall dot com, right? That's correct. Is that it? It's on. It's on the website. Yeah, it's on the, yeah. the website. But that's the correct website, right? Mark Cobra Hall. Yeah, yeah, and the website's not quite done. I want to download my videos on there um, of, of all my events and, uh, you know, a lot of other different uh, videos, some of my fight stuff. So I just haven't done that yet because I don't really know how, and I'm trying to find somebody <laughs> who can actually Maybe help me finish my website. Hey, hey K-Man, you know any nerds could help him out with that? Mickey Gaskins could probably help him out if yeah, he doesn't a, poop a, his pants. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fighter in that gym. He's a nerd. And he pooped his pants yeah. in a fight twice. <laughs> That's what I need. I need a nerd that knows how to, how to do that. We make sure yeah. he wear diapers. Yeah. We, we try yeah, and get him on the please. podcast every time. It's our little Easter eggs. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny as hell. <laughs> yeah. If he was, he broke one of the mics in the studio. We have this awesome, totally nice studio, and he broke one of the mics for like 400 bucks down yeah. the drain. <laughs> Fucking guy. <laughs> tried to steal it. No tried to put it in his coat. <laughs> no way. Yeah. That's funnier than hell. It is. <laughs> you know fighters, man. Are you still putting on promotions now? Or when the Ken Shamrock thing kind of fuck everything up for you? Yeah, him and Terry. Um, I just got tired of fighting everybody. You know, um, at the time, um, 
at well, not at that time, but a few years later, Dana White had purchased the USD and he was about to legalize it. And so I just uh, I did an event off the reservation and uh, cops raided it and shut it down, and it cost me a lot of money. And it was a really big hit for me. Uh, I, you know, I was at, at the time I was trying to get my kids, uh, my two older teenage boys, out of juvenile hall, so I had to have a legitimate place to live and stuff and all that stuff like that. And, you know, I was uh, going through separations with uh, one of my girlfriends and stuff like that. One of your girlfriends? uh, (laughs) How many girlfriends you got? Maybe that's why you got to separate. One at a time, man. You got to do one at a time. To catch on quick, they're smart. Women are smart, man. (laughs) Yeah, they're smarter than the FBI. (laughs) They work harder, too. Smarter than the FBI. That's funnier than hell. I got to remember that one. That's funny. <laughs> it's true. It's Ra- fucking true. It is, dude. Ra- Ray's our comedian. Yeah, I'm on. I'm under investigation every day, <laughs> searching my cell phone and <laughs> Facebook. Yeah. I'll stop sending those wiener pictures then. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just, I just said, you know, I'm gonna go back to construction, and if I, I. I told myself if I ever do that I'm going to get my license. You know, I was getting older. Um, I don't know if you know it or not, but I I have I the, I had this heart condition, and I was trying to get insurance, and I couldn't. I had to go down to the county hospital all the time for my medication and everything, and all my medical uh, help, and so um, I just. Um, uh, you know, uh, went back to school and got my uh, my general contracting license and my C9 drywall, and I started doing that, and I was doing really well. I mean, I, I was making 250000 a year. Um, um, all the contractors here in California were getting fat, and I, and I got a, a piece of the action, and everything was going really good. I bought a nice home, swimming pool. Um, I, I had a ministry, uh, started a homeless ministry started and all this stuff was going on. And then all of a sudden the bottom fell out of everything here and that there was no work. All my expensive yellow page ads quit working for me. Nobody was calling me. And, um, all my uh, contractor uh, buddies were the same way. Um, and so, um, I figured, well, you know what the best thing to do is to sell everything, file bankruptcy, and go into hibernation and, uh, you know, have uh, a fun down at the ocean with my kids. So I opened up a company called Hallmark Aquasports, and I was teaching uh, uh, spear fishing, uh, beginner, beginner surfing, and snorkeling. And um, I did that for about um, three or four years. And, he, he, you know, I already had all the equipment. I, I, I just bought a little bit uh, more. So I, I was, I had probably 40 wetsuits, 20 surfboards and things like that. And a whole, whole bunch of snorkeling and fins and all that and uh, spear guns. So I just, um, grouped of like two to four people, sometimes uh, six down at the ocean. And I always took my kids with me. So when we got done with the, class you know we could have fun and we always took the money and got a hotel room and, and uh, uh, stayed down there longer we just were having a good time hallmark aqua sports never netted much money but man you know we had a a great time and i bonded with my other uh, not those two teenage boys i was telling you about they're over 30 years old now but these are my my younger two uh, from another wife I think uh, I see. I sense where your money problems are coming from, Mister Hall. Yeah, you, you guys know. <laughs> you know I'm Mormon. Don't you? you know I'm Mormon, don't you? I did not know that. Are you? Are you really Mormon? No. Oh. No. <laughs> no, Mormon. I four or five wives. You know what? Though uh, I was going to, I was starting to believe that because you're from the West Coast, and they I know. I I totally <laughs> believed you too. I was just thinking West Coast, all these girls. You said multiple girlfriends. I was like, ah, maybe. <laughs> I'm like, we got to hang out with Mark Hall. We got to go out there in Southern California, caveman. He's got like four girls hanging off him. We can't go with Mark Hall. We're going to be in trouble, dude. We're going to be in trouble as soon as this goes live. <laughs> yeah, you know, 
I'm uh, well, I'm older, older now, but um, the West Coast girls, they're all materialistic. They're all Madonna girls, you know? You got to have a BMW, and, um, huh? I really, yeah, and they are they just want what they can get from me. I like, I actually like nice, sweet, innocent girls that cry a lot. I, I don't like them. <laughs> I, 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 like, I, like, I like Mexican girls. A lot of Mexican girls out there. <laughs> yeah, I was into Latino girls for a while, but then uh, then I wanted to go back. You know, after I got uh, scorched by one, I wanted to go back to the blonde-headed white girls. I think you gotta go with some yellow pride and get yourself a nice Asian girl, like I did. Asian girls are the way to go. I'm telling you. Caveman, caveman got an Asian girl. Yeah. No shit. No shit. Yeah. That's the way to go. Yoko Ono. <laughs> 12 years 12 years last couple weeks ago oh God damn. wow yeah, yeah. Damn, that's, okay man you yeah man i know wow that that that's good man that'd be a record for me <laughs> i didn't say 12 minutes i said 12 years <laughs> <laughs> i know maybe that's what's wrong i I um uh, I'm I'm just not good with relationships. I, I started realizing that you know maybe it's all not them. It's it's some me too. You know, and um I'm just not. It it goes back with my communication skills and stuff. Like I say, it's 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 really uh followed me everywhere I went, and it's uh you know it, it, it's not you know I'm not the best um, communicator. I'm 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 not very romantic or nothing. Me, you the just, same. Uh, <laughs> I just like to rip her fucking clothes off and, <laughs> you know, just stick it wherever I want. Hey, hey Mark. And, uh, hey, Mark, I'm not, rom- yeah. I'm not romantic either. And I don't talk to them. <laughs> I just want to play my video games. Leave me a hell alone. You know what? I watched a romantic comedy today with my wife before I came in here. I'm the romantic one out of the three of us. And that <laughs> is a sad statement to make. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you get laid tonight, brother. <laughs> I hope you do. Yeah. I, I hope so Let's as well. <laughs> I, I put a <laughs> prayer in to the angels of sex, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, and, and it's real hard for me because I'm, you know, I'm 56, and oh, um, it's real hard for me to find someone today because all my wives or ex-wives or, or even girlfriends have been tinged in this. 12, even 15 or 17 years younger than me. And so it's very hard to even date a woman that's 45, much less 56, my own age. Go to I mean, you can imagine. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, I, I mean, if you could imagine sticking your tongue in your grandma's mouth. The dentures. Know, it, it just ain't happening. And, and uh, I can't dentures. do it. And, and, um, it's, and, and so, and then if I go back, 11 years to uh, and get me a woman that's 45 then she has a bunch of teenage kids left over from a marriage that hate you you know they <laughs> don't know. like you he's not my daddy You're dating a brother, you know and uh, it's so hard to date right now that it's just like i honestly you guys i like prostitutes i mean i'll, I'll be franklin d roosevelt with you Hey, yeah. nothing wrong with that you you paid them you get laid and they they you know don't don't got to talk yeah. to you that Bye bye. I, I think I got the answer for it. I think you should go with three eighteen year olds. That that'll get you up in the ears that you need. And um <laughs> Man, I think you'll be alright, there's I no like kids. It. Yeah. Dude, you should be a mathematician, brother. <laughs> That's and perfect. Probably pays better than a podcast guy. Came is a good therapy guy. <laughs> Man, he is good. That's yeah. that's that's a- I'm Fuck, you're my new re- you're my relationship counselor, brother. All right, dude, I, I, I'm gonna give you his number. You can I, call him anytime <laughs> you want. <laughs> you sure can, man. Fuck yeah. I double as life coach, so I, I'm already life coach for a couple of people. We can make it work out. It's no problem. <laughs> we, we, K-Man should have a, uh, yeah. a, a a a podcast relationship goals. Uh, yeah, as I should. Long as I don't get, <laughs> as long as I don't get herpes, gonorrhea, AIDS, or syphilis, brother, I'm good. All you got to do is put the rubber around the Johnson. You'll be good. Lots of duct tape. <laughs> duct tape fixes everything. It's all right. Wait, uh, Dan Cox it's selling good. condoms. <laughs> yeah, we can get condoms from Dan Cox. <laughs> from <laughs> Cox's box. <laughs> Custom oh, condoms. Yeah. Custom condoms by Cox. 
We're gonna have to plug him in this one. Yeah, now. He'll like that. <laughs> yeah, we got. Yeah. yeah, yeah, duct tape's great. I mean, <laughs> fuck yeah. that's, how, that's how you keep the eighteen-year-olds around with the duct tape. <laughs> only, only, only I put it on her mouth. <laughs> what? After she's done with with that part, I put it on her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god this one's getting out of control this is our coolest podcast I yet hear talk. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm bad man i i just uh i don't know i oh i should have more respect for women i i i, I really should and i i do i mean i'm you know we're just all guys here talking but i mean it, you know i i have a you know i i'm older and so i have a little bit more respect but I admit, you know, I'm fucked up. I mean, I'm, I'm a fucked up guy. I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know too you many know? normal people that get in a cage and punch other people in the face, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> me and Ray, we both fought. We, we definitely understand what goes into it. And like, you can't yeah. be all there. There's a lot of dedication that no one really understands. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and I noticed uh, like, a lot of the fighters were divorced. You know, because there wasn't no money in it back then, and you did spend a lot of time down at the gym. And uh, if you know, if you didn't, you you, you might lose your fight. So, you know, I, uh, it was a lot of a lot of work away from home. You know, away from the, the I gotta, home fire. I gotta say, even with the money involved today, you still see so many divorces going on and uh, breakups. But I think a lot of it is just because dedication and time that the sport requires. You're away from your, your loved one for so much time. And you, you have to be really selfish. You have to put yourself yeah. before anyone else. And that's the only way to go you out do. there and compete at that level. And, uh, yeah, if you had the right woman, I, I mean, to, who supports you 100%. Because a lot of times you go home and you're so, you're so sore and wore out. You know, you just, you know, lift your arms sometimes. You, you know, you work out so hard. And then she's, and so when you are home, you know you're you you just want to you just want to take a nap or something. You know you want to go to bed. Yeah, you're gonna definitely need a blue pill after that during the sessions sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I should tell my wife just give it a couple of jerks and climb on up because I'm not gonna do. I can't do anything, man. <laughs> or just suck my dick because that'll be good. You know. Yeah. All right. Well, no. let's uh, let's try and get off this top for a little bit, and we'll go into something more wholesome. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask you about religion, but let's just skip over that and give the the viewers or listeners a couple seconds to digest what we were just talking about. Can you um talk about your heart? Condition? Yeah, we we don't need to go from that to religion. That would be like going from black to white. You yeah, know, like, that was my next segue, from, but uh, white to darkness. <laughs> you know, that was. Yeah, believe it or not, I'm I'm very very religious. Believe it or, or not, I, I mean you haven't heard me say GD this whole time because you know I can say different words, different things, and thank God for uh, for 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 Jesus Christ, I can be forgiven right now. You know, for uh, for my because I'm not perfect and I'm uh, pretty fucked up individual in my relationships and stuff like that. But, um, you know, my relationship with him, I got up and went to church this morning, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I put that first above everything else is my relationship with, with Jesus Christ. So does, does that really help you get through those tough times when you were losing everything, when you lost your family? Oh your job? yeah. Yeah. Can you talk yeah about it the... wasn't nobody else. It was only God, only, only Jesus, because most of the time there was nobody else there, man. There was nobody else to talk to, did you, you know, and uh, he's the only one I could talk to that wouldn't make fun of me. So, <laughs> did you do you find God young and as a young age, growing up with a stuttering problem, or did you find God when you, you lost everything? No, no, I, uh, I I definitely found him when I was growing up. You know, uh, my aunt Flot um, took me over to the side. She was uh, saw my disposition. Why I was fighting with my brothers all the time, why I was fighting with the neighborhood kids all the time. And, you know, I was a good person. I had a good heart. So I didn't just, you know, uh, and she opened a, a big family, but told me about, uh, about this uh, guy named Jesus Christ. You know, every, it just grew from there, you know, so it, it was, uh, uh, it, it was having my Aunt Floss that first introduced me 
to uh, God, you know, and that kind of thing. But that was about six years old. And, and then I finally, um, one of the few times my dad took us to church when we were teenage kids, I think I was 14 when I went up that stage, and it took me like probably 30 minutes to go through the salvation prayer because I stuttered so bad. But the guy up at the front of the church just stood there and waited the whole time. And before we even got done, everybody had left the church. Everybody was gone. And I'm still trying to get the words out. You know, Romans 10, 9, 10, that if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus uh, and believe in thy heart that God was raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For, for with the heart, um, uh, for with the mouth, confession is made unto righteousness. Uh, I mean, confession is made with the heart. You believe it's unto righteousness. And so that took me um, a, about a half hour to get that out. And uh, by, by the time I got out in the car where my dad was waiting in the parking lot with my brothers in the car, of, of course, they didn't know where that came from. You know, where the hell did that come from? But see, they didn't know that I had been talking to God all those years. You know, they didn't know that. And so um, then I had their relationship with them. Uh, under, I didn't really fully understand it either. But you do have to talk to somebody to have a relationship with them, you know. You and do. so maybe that's why, because all these words that got backed up during the day, in the evening, I, I would go somewhere alone, and I had to get it all out of me. You know, I couldn't leave it in. And so I would just talk to God, and that's what happened. That's how I I developed this 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 big bond, this big relationship with Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, your your dad waited outside while you you gave the speech. I'm I'm a little confused. No, well, he was in the car when was, uh, when I was you know the guy at the front of the church, the church uh, worker that helps you go through the prayer. You know, right? You know, w when you go forward uh, at the church. Well, he actually ended up taking me in this little room oh. after, after about 15 minutes, and so, so I could finish it up. Oh, okay, so okay, okay here, yes, sir. Nobody was in there, so my dad was out in the car waiting. I got you, I got you. But, I, was just, uh, I was just wondering how much support you had at home for your beliefs, too. That's kind of where I was going with that. Um, was, your family, sorry, I, I, was your family religious? That, that's pretty much what I was saying. Was, was your family supported well, support you and your religious Well, we didn't beliefs? go to church a lot or nothing. Maybe every once in a while. My dad went through several de de uh, divorces, so it wasn't like we, you know, we had the same, the same nice little, little family home all the time. So, but, you know, uh, most of us believe in, you know, when you're growing up in middle America, you know, you all believe in God, you know, you all believe in Jesus, uh, you know, we're all Christians, you know, um, you know, now there is a lot of mix going on, you know, there's a lot of other religions here and stuff like that, but back then, we weren't atheists, you know, but we didn't go to church a lot, you know, but um, I had to have something to turn to. Um, if I was suicidal, I would have killed myself. I mean, that, that's how that's how depressed I was, and that's how bad things were back then, because I couldn't get it nowhere else. And you know, back then, people—this was back in the '60s—people didn't know what to do about stuff like that. You, you know, they didn't know what to do about somebody like me who who couldn't talk. And even at school, they were merciless. My teachers, you know, made me read out loud in class. They made me. But I couldn't get any words out, but they still made me. So after class, I got made fun of all like crazy, you know, because everybody, or during class, people would poke at me. So if I had a book report, if I didn't read it, I got an F, which, by the way, an F means failure, you know. And, and, and so I was just a failure all the time, you know. I just, you know, I knew to hang on because one day, you know, one day I, I, I would rise up, you know, and I, uh, I would uh, be able to speak like everybody else. Yeah, yeah. I've got a serious question for you. Do you think in today's society, with the way we're more more forgiving with with people's problems and disabilities and stuff, that you would have a totally different life? Um. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're probably right because there was a lot of bullying going on back then. Uh, probably more than there is now. My parents didn't even know what to do about it. Um, they took me to a speech therapist once. And the speech therapist used to come all the way over to my school just to talk to me. I mean, just to have me in. And I started speech therapy in the first grade, but it never did me a damn bit of good. It didn't do me any good at all. 
what they would teach you was the breathing techniques, you know, breathing techniques. And so I started practicing those. And believe it or not, um, I'm glad they did because that's how my breathing technique, you know, breathing, the proper breathing techniques for an athlete takes years to develop. That's, you know, my breathing technique got really, really developed really well. You know, I just uh, had been stuttering since I could talk for so long. I had been stuttering. That it was just a, a bad habit that I, I I couldn't seem to break, you know. And uh, like if I went to a party, I hated parties. I hated get-togethers or anything like that because uh, you know I'd be the guy over in the corner not saying nothing to nobody, you know. Sounds like Ray. And then <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is and, me. <laughs> you know, and then if somebody would um. You know, like, I, I wouldn't be over there competing for the uh, girls because I would, uh, if one of the guys wouldn't embarrass me, I would end up embarrassing the hell out of myself by trying to speak. So I was the guy waiting for the uh, uh, the rogue girl, the one that breaks away from everybody to, to uh, walk away, and then I would go ambush her, you know. and uh, Hopefully you didn't bring the duct tape. Uh, and so I always got the one I didn't want, you know. I always got the fat girl or something, you know. <laughs> That's what Ray was just making an image of a fat girl. It's so funny you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get with the fat girls, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what they say. Yeah. <clears throat> now Ray is a fat girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. K-Man okay, messed up. <laughs> That's so funny. I'm the fat girl now. You guys are funny, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but um, thank you. Tell all your friends that we're funny. <laughs> Tell them to listen. <laughs> we, need, we need some fans <laughs> in California. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I like pretty girls too. I like skinny girls too. That's what I wanted, you know. And you know, every once in a while, I got one like that. But you know, it wouldn't last long because they would eventually want you to talk to them, you know. After a couple of weeks, they're looking at you like, why, why haven't you said anything to me, you know? You should have told them, uh, well, <laughs> I'm going to say let your actions speak for themselves. <laughs> That's why they ran away yeah. from the duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> I used to also purposely choose girls that talk a lot, you know, so I wouldn't have to speak. That's a smart move. There's girls that don't and talk I a lot? Girls. <laughs> oh, that I, is. I, hate, I hate that now. I hate girls that talk a lot now. I mean, I could really use that duct tape really, really. really <laughs> I could hate it. I, I don't want her to say nothing. Just don't say anything. You know? They need to so. get their nails done. <laughs> Petty Manny. Yeah. Yeah, go get your nails done. You know, <laughs> get a Brazilian <laughs> wax <laughs> and <laughs> come back and <laughs> suck my dick. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that, that's all I do. I mean... I mean, uh, forgive me, Father, but uh, that's, uh, I, I don't know. That's one of my weaknesses, I guess. That's what happens you know, you know, to you know, the things I, the, the, the things I want to do, I don't, and the things I don't want to do, I do. <laughs> you know? But thank God for for that sacrifice at, 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 at Calvary, you know, that, that I'm, uh, you know, forgiven, you know. Hey, uh, I want to. I don't I, gotta worry about it. Hey, Mark, I want to ask ask you a question. Um, when you fought in Brazil, IV, IVC yeah. two, I believe it was, and uh, uh, you fought uh, Luis Fraga, and um, I saw that fight, and that was a brutal ass fight. You had that full mount on him, and then um, you were sticking your chin in his eye socket. <laughs> did, did they make that rule to stop you? Actually, I'm I'm pretty sure that that rule was uh was that is that the Mark Hall rule? I, I'm almost positive that that rule was made up because of that incident, right? I'm being serious. <laughs> that guy, you know, people want to, you know, reverse things around and and like still Braga, still Vaji, whatever his name was. You know, he made a big deal about it. Like, that's what made him lose the fight. Well, he didn't tap because I stuck my chin in his eye. He tapped from the punches, if you notice. Right, right. And, and I was actually putting my, ch my chin on his temple. 
it hurts like fucking hell. I don't know if you guys ever done that little technique before. Oh yeah. But I never did it, it but I gotta you, try it. Ray's never been on top yet. I've been on <laughs> Well just, you have to push your I've been on top, I just couldn't finish with my master is ground and pound. <laughs> Race ground upon and gets on top and breathes on you because he's so tired from getting the takedown. <laughs> he's a <rest>. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to fart sometimes. <laughs> you know, that would make <laughs> that make him tap right away. There's a new rule. Yeah. If you uh, if you lose control of your body, he flunk- functions as a TKO now. We always got to bring that up so he can make fun of Mickey Gaskins one more time for pooping himself. <laughs> Oh no way! He yeah, so in a fight? yeah, if you puke, yeah, he he shit himself in a fight twice. But the new oh, rule: if you puke yeah. or shit, you lost. Yeah, if you shit or you puke or you piss yourself, you lose a fight. Now, that's an actual rule. <laughs> We're gonna call it the Mickey Gaskins rule. Yeah, <laughs> that is so funny, man. <laughs> oh, that is fucking hilarious. What do you think about the new rules since you fought with the old old style rules? So if you want to, if if you want out of a fight and you want an honorable exit, you, piss yourself. You don't want to just tap out. Just just take a just just crap, crap your pants. Make sure you eat some Taco be Bell <laughs> before the fight. <laughs> eat a Taco Bell. A large pizza and a couple <laughs> beers will do it for uh, some people. <laughs> you can't get any beer. You need to get the German beer. Get some X laxers. <laughs> get the German beer. Not even the in the cooler. Just. That is so yeah, Dan Severn actually talked to us about uh, the wrestlers that used to take X lax and have some problems. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Severn. Yeah. Yeah, he's cool. Dan's a friend of mine, you know. But not Don Fry. He's not. But you don't like so, Don Fry? Uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> no, I don't even want to talk about him. I, I, I do not like him at all. But he's got he's that porn stash. Fucking... That's like a world class porn <laughs> stash he's got. <laughs> You gotta talk about the stash at least. You don't gotta talk about him. He looked like Magnum P.I. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, mm, you know, everywhere I looked, when that guy came into UFC 8, I had actually had a fractured skull, so I couldn't fight in UFC 8. So, um, I, I came back in UFC 9. I'm, I, I had fighter of the night. I, I mean, and I gave it to him. So they gave me fight of the night, and they gave him fighter of the night, but I thought I was fighter of the night and fight of the night. Because since I beat the world sumo champion in, what, 42 seconds? Oh, yeah, you broke but, his nose. <laughs> I yeah, that, and, I then, that fight. and then Don Fry fought somebody half his size. I mean, big fucking deal. And he got fighter of the night, and he was already the UFC champion. And he was just fighting somebody... Their first time in the UFC. The guy was a uh, a good fighter. He was a uh, Brazilian world champion, a uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu world champion, uh, Amre Bakesh. But followed me to he followed me to UFC ten. All of a sudden, I'm fighting him the first fight in UFC ten. Well, why didn't they? Why did they make me fight the world champion heavyweight? Why didn't they give me somebody? You know, more my size. Give John Fry somebody more his speed and if we met in the end so be it <clears throat> you know because it was a, a tournament style well it didn't work out like uh, like that yeah you know they but the ufc were going through learning stages also but they shouldn't have put us together like that in, in the first spot of the night i deserved a, a fair chance at victory too you know and um they sh- uh, shouldn't have did that to me but they put me with him and it pissed me off so bad that I was actually going to rise up to the occasion and beat Don Fry <coughs> with my secret weapon. What's your secret weapon? And, uh, Duct tape. <laughs> my back kick. <laughs> my my back kick, but I didn't warm up with it enough backstage. I didn't want anybody to see me using it uh, at all until I went out there. And I was going to... Because I, I kicked a dude with it one time. I've knocked the breath out of a lot of people with it just sparring around the gym and and in kickboxing matches. But I I was going to, even if I didn't break his rib, even if I knocked the breath out of him, I would win. I knew I would win the fight. And I almost landed it, you guys. I almost got it. And I didn't. And when he body slammed me, my grandmother felt that <laughs> all the way to West Virginia. Damn. And, uh, yeah, and, and so 
it knocked the breath out of me. So here I am trying to catch my breath because I swore to everybody. Because even then, a lot of people didn't like Don, uh, Don Frey, especially his, his old entourage that he cut loose. And they walked up to me in my dressing room before the fight, and they said, we hope you beat the fuck out of him, man. And uh, I said, well, yeah, I am. And if I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go the distance with him. And so I went to quit. They stopped the fight, but I, I went to distance. There was only like a, like 30 seconds left in the fight. And so, but it was, and then his whole entourage was mad at me <laughs> because, because I wore him out because I should have tapped when I knew that I was going to lose. And I told him, well, I don't fight like uh, that. You know, if I needed to take him in the later minutes of the fight um, uh, to wear him out and, and then catch him in a, you know, a submission holder or something, that's my uh, strategy. That's how I fight, you know. I, I was going to yeah, say, that, that fight is one of the reasons why I actually liked you and I wanted to get you on, on this podcast because you showed so much heart in that fight. And, and that's the first time you re- you made a huge, huge name for yourself. You know what I mean? I mean, you beat... Uh, yeah. You beat the crazy karate guy in, in UFC uh, Seven, Howard Hero Howard. I'm trying yeah, to get him you on beat, too. You beat Caveman Hero. Yeah, I like that guy a lot. And he drove through <laughs> Tim Horton. He drove through Tim Hortons too. He's all fucked up and drove through Tim Hortons. I've heard. So I, I want to ask him about that too. But uh, <laughs> he's from Canada and he's like, "If you're gonna get it, let's get it on." He takes the glasses off, man. It was super, super cool. I like. I just like his promo. But um, I, you beat him yeah, and you yeah. lost to Varlins. And that Varlins fight was another tough one where he showed a lot of heart. But that Don Fry fight, Don Fry was supposed to be this unstoppable beast, and you're smaller than him, and you 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 rolled out that whole fight. It was it was amazing to watch at the time, and uh, like well, I always, I always get beat up too, so I, I understand that feeling, and uh, I usually come back and get the win at the end, just like you're talking about doing too. I never got beat. Well, up yet. I mean, I, I tell everybody that I, I really fucked his knuckles up really bad. You know? Yeah, I was trying to break and, their hands and their shins on my head. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, he was um, the toughest guy I've ever fought by far. I'll be honest with you. It it was really tough. It it was a a really, uh, he's a tough son of a bitch. I I admit it. I mean, he's a better, stronger fighter than me. Okay, I surrender. I admit it. I mean, but but, um, the whole thing is, no matter who they put in front of me, I'm going to do my best, you know. But he, he kept he kept showing up everywhere I, I, I was going, you guys. Maybe and, he's um, looking to get you with some duct tape. You better look then out. Then he shows up. Well, then they yeah. <laughs> then they show up in Japan, um, and they put me with him again. Uh, out of uh, that, I, I, that was a we'll get revenge on Mark Hall for being the reason you lost UFC ten, and uh, I think Coleman would have beat him anyway, but. You know, they are, they always blame me for that. And, uh, his whole entourage and Robert did, the Persia didn't get his, uh, uh, paycheck, you know, his manager and stuff like that. They went home, uh, uh, broke that, that, that night and they, and they got mad at me, real mad at me. And so mad at me that they wanted revenge and they wanted to, to my debut in Japan. Robert de Persia told me, you know, he, he, he was real mad at me at first. Then they started acting nice because I wasn't, putting up with their attitude at, at the after fight party at the UFC 10 and and they told me hey we got a thing going in in Japan it's called the U Japan and we want to uh I'll manage you and you can fight somebody your own size and and I'll pay you ten thousand dollars you know well back then that was like that's what I'm talking about that's 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 what I've been wanting you know that's what I, and so I hadn't been to Japan yet, but I wanted to go because I had been Coach Gattel, and they already had a fan club over there. And so I was um, <clears throat> about a week before the fight, they, uh, before I was to fly out, Robert DePerza called me and told me, hey, there's nobody for you to fight except Don Fry. And I knew right then that I had been had. And there was nothing I could do because I could say no, but I had to have money. You know, my um, bank account was empty. And I had to have some money to keep my school going and stuff because I was training full time. I didn't have another job. I taught, and I had I had several instructors in my school, but it wasn't making that much. You know how, you know, it doesn't make a family. You know, you got a big overhead, you know. And uh, 
I, but I didn't want my debut in Japan fucked up either, but unfortunately that's what happened. But I'll be honest with you, Don Fry must not have trained for that fight <clears throat> because he almost lost. I'll be honest with you. Um, I saw him huffing in a, a puffing. I don't know if you know it, but I, I broke his uh, a nose with a reverse headbutt. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so um, I still think I could have beat him. But a week before the event, I broke my rib while I was training. I, I cracked one of my ribs. You know how that is. You can't, you can't even move. But I started taking corner zone shots. And I, I, I had to... I had to, you know, uh, go because I had to uh, get that paycheck. I, I, I had to have that uh, money, but I wanted to uh, beat Don Fry at the same time. And if I wouldn't have had those cracked ribs, I would have won that fight. I already know I would have. It, 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 there's no doubt in my mind, but I don't know if you guys know it, but they got me down there all by myself. They didn't give me a second ticket or nothing for nobody. They said... Because Robert DePurge started managing me at the time, too. So he was managing all the big uh, names, Dan Severn, Don Fry, Dave Benito, you know, and all these other guys. And so I thought, wow, I'm in a, a stable of champions. You know, I thought I had, you know, I'm this middle, mid-level fighter, and wow, I've risen to the top, you know. I, I thought, wow, you know, look at me, you know. And so, so I went on ahead and let him manage me, which was a big mistake. I shouldn't have done that because... In the back of his mind, they were wanting revenge on me. They were wanting to actually uh, beat me so bad that I uh, that I quit the sport the, the sport completely because I could take these big guys the, the distance, or I could uh, beat them, which makes them look bad because they got beat by somebody smaller, you know. And they wanted me out of the UFC. They, I, they actually wanted to blackball me, <clears throat> so they got. They got uh, the, the polar bear. Everybody in that uh, tournament, believe it or not, had a guaranteed win, except Mark Hall, you know, or at least that was uh, managed by Robert De Persia. Becky Levi, um, the, the polar bear fought a little skinny Japanese guy. I mean, big fucking deal. And he, and he was celebrating after he won. I mean, so what? You, you beat a guy that weighs 85 pounds. Big fucking deal, you know. And, um... But they said, uh, hey, Mark, um, because in the hotel leading up to the fight, I was over there by myself eating breakfast, you know, every morning by myself. And all those guys were over there bunched up because they weren't fighting each other. They were fighting Japanese people. I wasn't, you know, I was fighting somebody else. And uh, uh, well, I was fighting John, uh, John Fry, who was in our own stable. And then DePersia walks over to me. And he goes, have you just done? You know, uh, so I actually felt like I was down there all by myself. Like, I didn't have any, anybody to encourage me or in, anybody to... So they got me where they want me. They actually it took me out to deep water and they tried to, to drown me, is what happened. And it really pissed me off. I mean, I mean, I, did, I, I didn't act like or I didn't say nothing at, at the time. But now, Mark Hall wants revenge, you see. I want revenge now. Uh -oh. And uh, these guys were just, uh, and it, if I would have beat him, it would have been the, the perfect win. It would have shut all their mouths and everything. But I, um, you know, my uh, ribs were fucked up. Not only that, they gave me Paul Varland to work my corner. We'll give you Paul Varland to work your corner. So I said, okay, whatever. Then Paul gets with me. Hey, Mark, is there anything I should know about you and stuff? And I said, well, and I I don't know why I told him. I shouldn't have told him. He was eating every meal with those guys, and he was first. You know, you you, you got to swear to secrecy, uh, 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 bro. But and everything. So I, I told him about my ribs, and I shouldn't have told him because they were wrapped up. You know, I, I, w I was wearing a jacket, and he couldn't see they were wrapped up. And then right before I went out there, of course, I took the wrap off. You know, back then you you had to fight if you were injured, if if you know, and stuff like that. It wasn't like it is now. You know. uh so, Paul worked my corner. I go back to get a drink of water. I, I don't know if you've watched that fight, but watch it. And I go back to get a drink of water, and uh, Paul had drank all my water. <laughs> my cornerman, my cornerman drank all my fucking water. All of it. And I'm like, what the fuck? Where's my water? That sounds something like, like I, I would do. 
That's how it is with Ray at the podcast. I go to take a drink, and my drink is all gone. Ray drank it all. And I'm not even doing anything important. I'm just... I can't imagine going into a fight like that. Why? (laughs) Ray's watching Don Fry fights right now. (laughs) And so, so, Ray, your your, your little punching bag is sticking to the top of your throat, right? (laughs) You you, you can't get... You know, like mine was. I couldn't... uh, I had to have a drink of water. Cotton mouth in the fight is the worst. That's that's the motherfucking worst. No, you can't. And I and I mean, I listen. If if I would have had those ribs and I would have had an all pro corner like they do today, I mean, my career would have been so much better. You guys, I I just got a you know, it, it's just so sad what happened to my career and everything, and, and and it really is, and I'm really upset about it. Even to this day, it's hard to talk about it and, and stuff. But everywhere I went. I mean, I, I'm not done. This story goes on and on and on. And, you know, I'm just going to say, read the book because it's in there. It's just really a, a sad what somebody like Don Fike could, could uh, do to your career. Again, I came up, uh, I didn't have an amateur career and learn all these things that could happen uh, to you when you became a, a pro. I had to, I started at that um uh, you know, at the top, I didn't start at the bottom and work my way up. I started at the top and worked my way down. And so it it was, uh, you know, I had to go through my learning experience uh, as a professional when you shouldn't, you know. Oh, I saw so, the biggest stage in the world is where you learn how to craft. That's pretty yeah, crazy. Yeah. Every time I turned around, Don was there and he followed me. He was even in... Uh, Russia, when I went there to fight, he was in, uh, uh, then he shows up at the Ultimate Ultimate 96 again and just ruins my fucking, he, it, it was just a fucking nightmare. Every time I turned around, that son of a bitch was there. And now I can't even believe that he's in the Hall of Fame, you know? He's in the Hall of Fame and I'm in the Hall of Shame. And, and it should have never been that way, but it is, you know? It, it is what it is, but, you know, whatever. What do you think your career would have been like if you fought with weight classes? Um, I would be a champion. I, I would have a legitimate belt around my uh, waist. Listen, I fought all the fucking giants, and and then, um, what's his name, uh, Frank Shamrock, comes in the UFC, has one fucking fight in the UFC with somebody his own size, or a little smaller, and they give him a fucking, they vest him with the UFC middleweight belt. You, you know, now how does the fans think that I would have felt, you know, over that? It's bullshit. It, it's not even right, man. You know, how do you give somebody who comes in with has one fight a UFC belt? Not that he wasn't, you know, a worthy champion or something. Eventually, you know, he he, he grew into his belt. But what I'm saying is I, I fought... a. Well, a, example. I fought Koji Katao. He was a world champion. To be a champion, you gotta you gotta beat a champion. Okay, back then it was one martial art versus another. So I beat a world champion. I didn't get a fucking belt. I beat somebody twice my size. They didn't give me a belt. But but Frank Shamrock goes in and has one fight, and they give him the middleweight belt that I wanted. That that fucking belonged to me, you know. And um, I I never had the oppor- after uh, the opportunity after after Don Fye and Robert de Persia ruined my fucking career, you know. What weight would you so, have fought at? Probably uh, the same as like Vitor Belfort and people like that. Probably one eighty five, you know. Yeah. Okay. That's a that'd uh, be a good weight. I, I don't know exactly what weight that is now. I, I'm not really hep on the weight classes, but somewhere around there. That's one of the reasons. I'll be honest with you. That's one of the biggest reasons that I started, that I became a, a promoter and and started doing the events at Indian casinos because I wanted to wanted to bring weight classes to the sport, and because I didn't want what happened to me. You, you know, uh, misused. Uh, my c- c- career was misused. I got a bad taste in my mouth over the sport, uh, over the sport that I love and stuff like that. And I didn't want that to happen to, I- to anybody else. And any fighter in my federation will will uh, tell you 
that I did my very best to make everything as fair as I, I, I could for, uh, for them. And that includes not just by weight, but also by skill level. Because a lot of guys that were coming through my MMA door were guys who were just getting their legs in the sport. Maybe it was their first real fight, or maybe it was their second fight. And I didn't want, I wanted them to have a good experience through the whole thing, not like I had, you know. And I wanted to change that. And, and so that, that's one of the biggest reasons that I became an M MMA fight promoter, you know. Are you guys crying? Uh, not Does yet. I'm crying. I'm <laughs> crying. Damn it. I think I, I think I was closer to crying about the duct tape than uh, than that. But that... <laughs> that's good, man. That that shows what you give back to the sport, though. It's just that even though the sport yeah. grinds you up a little bit, that you you still love the actual sport itself. And and now that it is a sport, yeah. you went and you established yourself yourself as a promoter and brought the sport to the light more than other people have. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you promote again, caveman will be open for uh, commentating. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I will commentate <laughs> if you need. Right. If you, you're you're going to be first on the list. You're going to fight John Fry. I'll fight John Fry. I'll fight anybody. Oh yeah, caveman <laughs> fight anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started out. I, uh, I started fighting in '95 too. I fought some giant dudes myself. I'm uh, I'm about 145 pounds, so yeah, came yeah I bet. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's it's different, huh? I mean, it's uh, it's, it's not like shit. If somebody my own size. It, 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 if you see how fast I dispose of guys like Trent Jenkins, he was a little bit bigger than uh, me, but he, he didn't he didn't have a chance. I controlled the whole fight. Um, Felix Mitchell, I could, I controlled the whole fight, you know. Frank Del Uh Well, you know, if you notice, I won my first fight every single time I went out uh, of the night. You know, in every tournament, I always won my first fight. So I know I could win my first fight of the night no matter who I fought, no matter when, but um, except Don Fry. And is three of my fucking losses. I mean, that's bullshit, man. I mean, it's just bullshit, you know. Uh, I know I was better than that. I know I am. And and even uh, even today, right now, with my heart condition, I'll fight right now. I I know I could uh, uh, do good, but I can't pass the physical. But I would fight again in a heartbeat. I got. I, I want to fight again. I got two questions yeah. for it. One, I, I just pulled up your share dog um fight history and it's got you listed as three amateur fights in uh 2007 did you were you able to fight amateur after that or can you talk about that or is that uh just something that's wrong on your record okay share dog is, is friends with ken shamrock okay the guy i forgot the guy is in the name but he, he was friends with shamrock's dad and all those guys they used to come to my event i know those guys well what happened was when me and Ken got got into it at the casino and I turned that situation around and stuck it up Ken's ass, they were all calling me, Mark, you ought to drop this, man. You know, Ken's, um, um, you know, he can't focus in on his career, man, and <laughs> stuff like that. Well, you know, you know then, then he should fight me. You know, what if somebody fucking mugged you in a casino? What if he mugged you? What the fuck would you do? You know? Just because I was able to turn it all around and and get something out of it, you, you know, a, a lot of people wouldn't have been able to do that. They wouldn't know how to, to do that uh, legally, uh, you know. But it, it was because of my years as a, a bouncer that I, that I was I finagle all that legally and turn it around on on him, you know. And um, if I would have been able to uh, do that, then everybody just would have uh, said fuck you and forgot all about Mark Hall, but these guys, um, so to get me back, you know, a lot of people were doing things for Ken. A lot of journalists were lying like hell over it. There's a lot of lies. Uh, the journalists that were at that event, it's all lies. They, they lie like hell. It, it, it's all in my uh, book. There's not one lie in there, and the story's in there, but there was this one journalist over there um, his his name's in the book. I forgot it right now, but he lied. Uh, you know, he he was totally on Ken's side, totally in favor of Ken, and he was friends with the guy that um, uh, founded Sh Sure Dog. 
and and so they put these amateur fights in there. I don't. I never had amateur fights. I don't even know who these guys are. Those aren't my fights at all. But, but they stuck them in there to diminish me, to diminish my record and make me look uh, make me look bad. You know, basically. Yeah, I, they I, were. And he, so, hey, hey, K-Man, could you? Have and I don't know how to get and go amateur. Do you guys you know can. how to get rid of those? Oh, you have I would love to 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 call those guys up and say, "Hey, you're uh, you know you're lying. You're p- printing false material. Fighters a uh, fighter's record it means a lot to him, you know." Yeah, for sure. And not only that, it makes it makes you look really bad because that's actually something that you're not allowed to do by the commissions or anything is go from uh, pro, pro to amateur. Right. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So so those should be taken off of there a long time ago. You know, you know the fucking uh, joke's over. But they leave them there. You know, I don't know how to get them off of there. Do you? Uh, you'd have to contact the uh, administrator of that site. And I'm looking at these guys, and most this these guys have a lot of fights too. So maybe we could actually contact the fighters themselves and have them contact Share Dog as well. Um, I'm gonna look into that myself. I, that's a, something I'm pretty interested in. So yeah, lawyer caveman on the job. Yeah, yeah, caveman's on the on the on the test okay. now. Caveman, <laughs> caveman. If if you can achieve that for me, if you can get that off of there, because I don't know how. Like I'm not real computer savvy and stuff like that, and I can't get a hold of these people. I've looked on their sites and try to get a number to call or something like that. But if you guys could rally against them and say, hey. You guys are printing false information about fighters on your website. Mark Hall never had any amateur fights. Those aren't his fights, you know. Why would you put that on there if it wasn't true? And right. maybe they'll take it off. I'll get you know? I'll get your contact information from Ray. I'll have him send it over to me. Uh, he's he's a producer and uh, the funny guy on the show. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I'll see what I can do to get this taken care of. I'm, I'm huge Thank into you, the MMA community, and I don't like to see stuff like that. And uh, we'll end yeah, up getting yeah. to the bottom of it. Because I was looking at it, I'm like, how the hell could you be pro fighter and then go back to amateur? Yeah, it would never happen in the commission. Yeah. I mean, the only way that could happen is be a non-sanctioned fight on a reservation somewhere, but it says on NLF. Well, NLF. Also, I'll show you guys. Um, my last fight was in 2002. I had my heart condition during that time. My last fight was with uh, John. I would have beat John. I mean, I I had my heart condition. I was my my heart was pumping half the oxygenated uh, blood as a regular heart, and so I was gassing real fast. So I let John control the pace of the fight, and 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 in the last round, I, I was going to beat John. I mean, you know, um, I think uh, it was at my event, and um, what happened was I. I accidentally fell on my on my arm and it dislocated my shoulder. He didn't do it. He didn't get me in a submission hold and dislocate my shoulder. Nothing like that. It was just a freak accident that I accidentally did. And so my shoulder was all the way over my chest. It, it ripped completely out of the socket and everything. And you know, you know, I'm not one of those guys that can dislocate their shoulder. So it was a, you know. A first time shoulder injury like that is like really bad. It, it was it was, it was a bad injury. It stayed with me for like eight years uh, before it actually started getting better. It was the worst injury I've ever had, and so that's the only reason that I had to take that loss. John didn't win, or I didn't lose, and John didn't win. It, it was just uh, one of those ac- accidents. But in a normal situation, I can beat John. Uh, a cold, no problem, you know. All right. The only the only thing I could think of about the share dog thing is there might be another fighter with the same name and they attach the record to you. I've seen that happen yeah. before. There's a there's a couple women I researched and uh, they have pro yeah. pro lot or amateur losses against um like guys. So like you look into it and it's the same name as a guy and a girl, and sometimes it gets confused. So I'll, I'll look into it and I'll see what I can do. You know. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. We're running yeah, it. let me know what happens. I will yeah, for sure. That, that's awesome. I really appreciate it, man. I, I really, really want that off of there. It, it really, any fighter would. It, it really diminishes me a lot, and I, I, I really want, I've been wanting that off of there for years. And uh, I just didn't know how to go about it, you know. Yeah, well, I'll see what I can do. I, I usually can get to the bottom of shit, and if I can, I'll find someone that can do it. Um, 
But I want well, thanks a million. Brother. Yeah, I want to thank you for your, for your time. We got to be out of the studio in uh, five minutes, so I just want to let you go. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for everything you contributed yeah. to the MMA. And uh, make sure you hook up with yeah. Mr. Moore so you can get into the Legends of the Cage movie. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Me, yo, me, and Caveman. Yeah. Try to get in that. Yeah, and I want to give uh, another big shout out to Legends of the Cage. And, yeah. Um, uh, they're um. Man, we needed somebody like this to come along, you know, to to give us, to elevate us, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, give us the recognition, you know, that so much of us deserve, you know, in, in this great sport. So, and I want to thank you guys uh, also. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm not uh, much for interviews, and I'm not very, because I'm not very good at them. But I, I, I'll be honest with you, I feel real good during this interview. And it, this is probably the, the the best I've ever felt during a, an interview like this. So awesome! Man. Um, I'll, you, I'll try and edit up all the time. Awesome. It's not a great yeah. talk. Yeah, no, I know. I I get kind of out of hand. You get excited, you know? like every time we talk about them girls, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know what you're doing with your other hand, man. We're all good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey! It's better if the other hand doesn't know what the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you go clean your phone. <laughs> what goes on under the table stay under the table. <laughs> That's what you turn the other hand. What happened on Caveman's Corner goes out to the six fans we got. That's all. <laughs> You're pretty safe. <laughs> all right, my dear friend. All right. Take, Take care of your bad self. Talk yes, to you sir. Soon. Take it easy. All right, thank you. All right, brothers. Peace Bye. out. Well, Ray, we got another interview done. That one was a little crazy at times. Yeah, so let me ask you this. This interview right here, and then the Mark Coleman's. How long you think it'll take you to edit this one? This one, I think, will be easier than Mark Coleman's. Okay. Because this one, I just have to fix the the beeps and uh, take a little bit of the pauses out. Mark Coleman's, I had to edit, and I had to go back and re-listen to it, and then edit again, and then re-listen <laughs> to it, and then edit again, and re-listen to it. Mark Coleman owes me a big goddamn hug. <laughs> if he ever listens to what we actually did and uh, what we posted, he would be, I think, happy with our... What we ended up airing. I'm going over to his house for dinner. Are you? Yeah, he texts me. Really? You can bring the rice and beans? Yep. Did he like that? Did you tell him to listen to the thing yet? I told him. I ain't getting a response yet for, uh, you know, he ain't, he, um, I don't know if he, you know, saw the video yet, but, uh, I'm waiting on that to have a response. But, uh, yeah, I'm going over to his house for dinner. If he's mad, I'll send him the entire unedited, uh, version of it and then he can see if he's still mad. (laughs) Ha 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 ha. Wait a minute, caveman. If I go over dinner, <laughs> if I don't come back, you know who killed me. <laughs> yeah, his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best part of the interview, man, That when the girlfriend came on. Oh, yeah. That's that was really good. Was funny. Yeah. yeah. What did you think about all the duct tape stuff? Oh, it was hilarious, man. I, that was the worst segue that we've ever had on the show when we went from tying up girls to... <laughs> Thank um, God. Thank God. <laughs> I think we just took some years off our life, at least <laughs> our afterlife. Right. Holy Jesus! <laughs> yeah, but Mark Hall, you know, we got, you know, it was great to have him, you know, because uh, I remember watching the UFC and they interviewed him and um, his profile. They, you know, they was like, you know, he was bullied when he was a kid and he had to fight the bully. So, right, and uh, we we should pick up his book. I'm definitely interested to read his book now after talking with him too. Yeah, so you could go to his website. Or you, could, you could get a. Uh, I asked him if you could get an Amazon. He just kind of ignored that one, so uh, I don't know. Might be straight for his website. Yeah. It sounded like he published it himself, so. Oh, yeah. We'll yeah, see. I might have to check that book out, yeah. too. If it's that easy to publish a book, I think I'm going to write a book, too. You should. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to write a book, too. It's going to be about I'm going to write a book about it's, you writing a book. It's going to be about <laughs> drugs, MMA, um, you know, a little gangster stuff in there, and, uh, you know. And then, you know, family stuff. Wow, you sound better than my book already. <laughs> I was just going to write about fight. I don't know anything else. That's all I know about. Yeah. That's crazy. All right. So. Let's see if I can find oh, We got the new Mexican music, but I got to find it again. I lost it. So then you can take us out of here. Also, please subscribe to this page on uh, YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Please subscribe and like. Yeah. That's how we make our 18 cents a video that we're making. Right, we want to make more videos, so please yeah. help us out. 
We like to actually make money so we can just do this stuff. Yeah, I don't want to work no more. Ray's done working two jobs. I'm done working six jobs. and Well, I don't mind working six jobs if they're all fighting jobs, I guess. <laughs> just don't want to work a regular job because that's for suckers. Yeah, the working man is a sucker. Sucker. I love this song right here. We'll blast it. All right, Buffalo, New York, from the Fan Doozy Studios, we are out of here. Oh, that was a crazy ass interview. Dude, I don't well, know. I know. That's like uh, mental problems. Hopefully, he's all right. Now, when I see duct tape on the stores, I'm going to think about Mark Hall. I'm bringing some duct tape home tonight. I'm going to get laid. <laughs> you know what? I got to try that. It seemed to work for him. I'm going to go to Wegmans, get some duct tape. And oh, uh, shit, dude. We're still recording. Oh, damn.